Uh, today's uh, event is the uh, first of a series of virtual reunion events that uh, will be taking place over the next uh, couple months or so. We may have as many as 10 events uh, in October, November. So stay tuned uh, as we get these developed. Uh, I'm David Brown. I'm here in Portland, Oregon uh, with Nancy Mitchell in Walla Walla, Alan Goya in Boulder City, Nevada, and John Lauder, who's our featured guest today in Warrensburg, Virginia. This is the first of five sessions in our series, Artist is a Storyteller, with interviews by Alan. Uh, as I said, uh, this is perhaps the first of 10 events that we'll be putting on in the next two months, and we'd appreciate your feedback as we move forward. Today's session will uh, consist of an initial 30 minutes of conversation between Alan and John. Uh, followed by a meetup, Q&A, whatever you want to call it, uh, afterwards for the following uh, 30 to uh, 60 minutes. So what I'd like to do uh, just to begin uh, before moving over to uh, Alan in Boulder City is to share my screen with you with a shot uh, before and after of our featured guest today. Um, there we go. Okay, Alan, over to you. Okay, well, let's start at the beginning. Yes, John Louder. Um, hey, welcome everybody. Um, glad you're joining us. And kind of started, this is one of the reasons you see John there, um, probably this summer, I took that picture from this summer and, and uh, thank you to Nancy and David for facilitating this and making it happen. But kind of started off with a question regarding, um, you know, as I traveled around the Midwest, I saw the story of the Midwest kind of changing. You know, I, I knew a bunch of people that ran away from the Midwest. Matter of fact, I, I married one. And uh, and then when I came back to the Midwest, it seems like the story was changing here. And, you know, I went to museums and all of a sudden the story was not just about, you know, uh, land owning white guys anymore. It was about women, Native Americans. And it seems like we were re-exploring the story of America. And, and it got me, um, when I went to visit John, in Missouri, you know, I realized that, wow, John, you know, a Western artist uh, was telling the story of Missouri and he was telling it in a different way or a new way, but he was um, kind of like telling the people, you know, showing the people of Missouri uh, a different side of their, their state. And he ended up staying there. Um, I was surprised that, you know, John, an Idaho boy would uh, retire in Missouri, you know, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a great thing and a uh, story. And I said, well, let me, let me explore the story and, and see how John is telling the story of um, you know, Missouri and retelling the story of America in a certain way. So this is how this series started. And I, and I hope through these series of interviews with artists to kind of explore this, this question about how artists you know, tell our stories. So let's start with the first part of the story, John. How, how did you get to Whitman? Tell us how you get to Whitman. We saw your picture there. And, and uh... Well, let's see. I was, I was born and raised in Twin Falls, Idaho. And part of getting to Whitman is also being an artist. And in the first grade, I discovered my mother had carbon paper to use in her typewriter to make copies of things. And I found out that if I took the black the, uh, carbon paper and I put it on a, a board, and I tore a page out of my outdoor life, I could trace around that moose or elk or whichever right. I wanted onto that board. And then I could get out my wood burner, my wood burner, and I could trace all the way around that moose. Ah. And I took that to school in the first grade and I showed it to the teacher and she said, wow, that's really good. Did you do that freehand? So in my head, well, yeah, my hand yeah, was free, free on that wood burner. Yeah, I did yeah. it freehand. So I became the designated artist in the first grade by confusion, lying, whatever you want to call it. That's right. Or a perception. Somebody's yeah. perception said, <laughs> you're an artist, man. Yeah, so yeah. I, I was the artist from the beginning. I did posters for the teachers. I won the Valentine's cards. I took all the electives in junior high, in art class in high school. Uh, one of the alums... Todd Brumba came to our high school as a friend of my brother's and talked me into applying to Whitman and off to Whitman I went. I was at first either a chem major or art major. I was kind of undecided and then- oh, really? A chem major, huh? Yeah, I took chemistry the first 
it was different in high school than college. I took the first semester advanced chemistry and they wouldn't let us cook popcorn on the back Bunsen burner anymore. So that was the end of my chemistry career. And I pursued art at, at Whitman for four years. Uh, it was a kind of a divided education in the sense that with the limited number of art professors, most, you know, it wasn't a lot of art majors. I think there was about four or five or six of us. Um, the first two years, John Linder was the primary uh, 2D guy, so I did a lot of drawing and traditional formal training with him. Mm -hmm. And then he moved and went to New York City, and they hired a 3D guy who happened to turn out to be my cousin, Eddie right. Humphreys. And he moved into the new art building with all the new uh, ceramics wheels and sculptural areas. So I did two more years of sculpture and did my first first four years of education at uh, Whitman, learning about being an artist and trying to grow up, but not knowing really where that was going to go. Had, I right. didn't have the same sort of understanding of, it seemed like some of the other students already knew they were going to be attorneys or lawyers or dentists or stuff or such. And I, being a first generation college student, I probably could have been advised if I would have been willing to be advised, but you know, we're independent little well, you were you were my just full disclosure here. John and I were roommates in college. Oh well, yeah, absolutely. And, and he was, you know, an upperclassman, and I and I got to hang out with an upperclassman. So we were like the first one of the first residents of New Dorm, right? Yeah. yeah. I think. Oh yes. Well, we got stories yeah. about New Dorm, but yeah, and it was the seventies. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but New Dorm, right? And I remember your first artist. Um, one of the things you did was you painted on the restroom door men's restroom and women's restroom oh it was a, it was the first co-ed dorm and you and i got there early before the freshmen they had mostly freshmen in yeah. our, our floor i went down to ace hard where the doors were they weren't designated because they'd still separated it by genders so it was a men's floor but we put a women's sign on one door and men's sign on another door and you and i used the women's bathroom for the first semester right. and the freshmen all used the, the men's, the men's yeah and they thought we were just appalled they were appalled because we're in the women's we didn't, we didn't let them see yeah, that's okay. we had our own yeah. restroom for <laughs> yeah well yes. that was a great year but so so you know what had, so where did your journey go from whitman so you, you know you went from whitman and then you, you went south oh, you were still whitman, at Whitman, I tucked my tail between my legs, broken hearted. The college girlfriend sent me packing and I went home. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know, it happened. Know it happened. <laughs> and I entered my blue period, actually my blue, blue period. period, blue yeah. collar. And I worked for uh, a family business for uh, 10 years as a sheet metal worker. So well, that's right. You went back to Twin Falls, right? Learn how to bend sheet metal and install sheet metal. I, right. When I applied for graduate school, I told the application that I built octopus sculptures in basements all over southern Idaho. So ah. back to Idaho, did some growing up. And interestingly enough, I was attending my grandmother's funeral. And the minister, during his spiel, he mentioned that my grandmother had never wasted her talent, that she was a, a practice pianist. She played the piano every day. She played every week weekend at the church. And she wasn't wasting that God-given talent of hers. Well, so I'm thinking, oh man, I already wanted to go back to school, but made me make that decision and sold out on the company that I was part of and moved to Eugene, Oregon and enrolled as a post-baccalaureate student to really get into the whole swing of being an artist to develop my portfolio for eventually applying to graduate schools. My, my goal at that time was um, be a college professor. So right. two more years in Eugene, Oregon, uh, studying watercolor primarily. It was a wonderful Ralph Baker watercolor teacher there. And I did a whole nother degree. It's when you're post back, I just took 60 credits of art. So I did two years of nothing but art. It was really fun. Well, and at the same I, time, I think people ought to know is that you have a great interest in the outdoors and nature. Matter of fact, we're fishing buddies. And that's what makes you very special. Absolutely. And one thing to have buddies and a fishing buddy is extra special. That's right. I mean, those are hard to find and keep for a lifetime. I mean, friends for a lifetime. But I, yeah, I've always been outdoors, always been uh, interested in being outdoors. Idaho was very conducive to that. My father was very supportive of that. He moved from Kansas and loved hunting and fishing. So we did all of that kind of thing. So being curious about the outdoors and, and involved in it always 
backpacking, hiking, climbing, doing all of that sort of outdoor activity has been my life, absolutely. But also being very sensitive to the, the, the stages and they're like plants. I mean, one of, I mean, you see a plant here, orchids behind you, I can see it right now, but you know, the nurturing and the subtleties and the, you know, the growth phases. I, I've always been, always been that kind of curious person that kept the, the kid that kept the bugs, that kept the plants, that tried to grow stuff, that tried to do all those things that kids do that are curious. And that's been my whole life. I've always been things and trying to figure out where I am and what's going on. Right. So, so then it was application to grad school, and I um, moved to, got accepted at the University of Arizona. Right. So I moved down there and spent two and a half more years finishing up an MFA, which is what is required. It's a terminal degree in studio art. There's no PhD in studio art. And uh, a terminal and degree for nine more That's years. It, huh? <laughs> yeah, terminal. That's you know, that's an academic terminology for salary. If you have the terminal degree, then you get the top salary. Oh, really? Anyway, oh, okay. Another story. Okay. Yeah, that's that's academic terminology. Oh, is that, it doesn't mean salary. about limits. It's about pay scale. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, right. You got it. Okay. Well, I can't get. I couldn't get a PhD in studio art. There isn't one. So <laughs> everybody that had a PhD looked down on the MFA. So the MFA in, in studio art, in theater, in creative writing. There's a bunch of places where there's MFAs, and they, for some reason, didn't include PhDs. Oh well, yeah, but you anyway, can't be a doctor. Of another, art. Uh, I, yeah. Okay. No, no doctors of art. Even though my students would call me that, I just never corrected them. I thought that was right. Dr. Right. John. Yeah, that was. Dr. John cool. sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so then um, University of Arizona, graduate degree there, graduated, kept teaching uh, within the University of Arizona as a sort of a adjunct teacher, and I taught for eight years as a temporary teacher at uh, Pima Community College. I taught art in the uh, federal uh, prison there for a couple of years, so you have to build up this resume of teaching before you can start you, you can start applying but you're not going to get hired until you've got some history of it so mm -hmm. nine years in arizona i met my wonderful wife annie another artist and raised our kids and then finally i was accepted uh, in a tenure track position at the uh, university of central missouri here in warrensburg missouri right and i picked up the family and packed us ourselves out to missouri 23 years ago and that's how I got here. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. What did you think? What was that moment when you're like, did you even, have you even been to Missouri? Had you any idea when you, they said, yes, come? What, what did you think you're going to? Well, I did, I did fly in for an interview. So, you know, there was, there was some sense of what it was going to be like. It was more wooded than I had expected. And it was a new place. New is, new is great for me. I love new. Right. New is what it's all about. It's about discovering what, what you're what you're doing and the first place we rented and eventually purchased was a house on six miles out of town on 10 wooded acres with a creek in the corner of it so life's right. good lucky yeah <laughs> right and well you know this is a good time to talk about your first year in missouri so so what happens in your first year in missouri well being a tenure track uh professor you're going to have three obligations one is research and one is teaching well the service gets built up over time and they just keep asking you to join more and more committees so i knew the first year i was going to have to do something to keep my motivation going just before i'd left arizona i did a, a series called the calendar series and the calendar series was one of those new year's resolutions we don't have any images of the calendar series but I did a small little acrylic painting on old watercolor paper once a day for a whole And I framed up all of those paintings behind glass, on frames, on mats, and, and was fortunate enough to show those in the Desert Museum in Tucson, which is a really internationally recognized destination. So each one of those paintings became a date for a month. So the month was basically six feet by eight feet six feet tall, eight feet wide, and it filled up the whole room. So people came to the exhibition, of course, they wanted to go see what their birthday was like, what it was like, and, and that was very, very successful. And we hung that show the day before I was interviewed, and that was the hit of that era. So when I came here, I decided to continue with this idea of the landscape as, a, as more than just a landscape, but actually a 
communication of time, time passing. So, and also of my new discoveries on this land that we live in. So the Missouri Discovery Series was the next series that I did. And I decided to paint five foot tall paintings in, in our little garage. And Nancy, can we get that up? With two, two a month. What's that? The, oh, we're going to yeah. going to bring up a uh, discovery series here. Here we go. Well, that series went on for two on one painting. I'd started at the first of the month. Then I'd move it over and I'd bring in a new canvas and attach it to the one that was there. And I'd start that one and keep painting. And I did that for a whole year. And so it's a painting that's five feet tall by 90 feet long. And pack that around all over the, the regional areas for exhibitions for many years. And finally, uh, it was purchased by a bank and it's in a public collection. So each one of these, these uh, paintings is basically about what I'm discovering here in Missouri. There's, there's a sense of, of me being, being a Western artist with a vocabulary that's been trained in Western visual information. Mm -hmm. uh, the colors, the the palette, the the vocabulary, but I'm learning a new vocabulary, and I'm excited by it. You know, so I'll pick up a, a bug, I'll, I'll bring in a staghorn sumac, and watch it change color, and and then the landscape behind it is basically our property traveling across that 90 foot span. And the last paint, last painting connected to the first painting, so it could be shown in a circular room. So five feet high by 90 feet, and it would just be the, the rotating seasons. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was, I yeah. It was a big project the first year. Yeah, well, I enjoy, I, I actually went to the bank with you and we saw the painting. And, you know, I, I can't say enough about um, what, what an artwork feels like in a space that needs to be displayed, you know, not just on a, on a picture, but on a wall and the waste in that, that that whole corridor, that stairway where it's displayed is just a brilliant place to, to, um, to display that work. Also, you know, talking to the people there at the bank, you know, that, that becomes part of their identity, you know? I mean, they're so proud of that. And when, they, when they're in that bank, this is Missouri. They, they sit there and they're, you know, here's Missouri for, for the whole year. And it's really cool to see the whole, you know, how the bank interacts with that piece. No. Yeah, I think that you know, if you're making art that that you're excited about, it's easier to produce work that other people can be excited about. So that whole freshness and uh, the energy that I you know was being driven by by this new job and new space, I didn't have time for a midlife crisis. That's for sure. It was too too much things, too many things going on to worry about that. It was good. Right. Well, you know, I think it's important to think. Why do you think? Um, I mean, to me, you know, your body of work, you know, all of a sudden it's like, like, did people react to your works a little bit differently because you're a, a Western artist or did they, you know, was this, you know, where did you see yourself in the tradition of this thing, you know, as far as art in Missouri at that time? Well, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a representational artist in the sense that I paint uh, objects and, and, and subject matter that's recognizable. But I also try to add another level of uh, thinking about it. I like to try to add another level of content to the, to the typical landscape. So um, objects of, you know, laying over the top of a landscape makes us think about you know, different ways of seeing the landscape. The idea of the landscape being a moment of time, talking about it being more than just a landscape, but it, it, it does talk about that moment that you're painting well, let's, so, look at, let's look at those figurative landscapes here, which kind of juxtaposes a lot of ideas. Yeah, being an academic, I mean, nine years full-time college professor uh, did hours and hours and hours of drawing from the figure. It's, it's a way for us to be honest. And, and so this is somewhat like the Missouri Discovery Series, but yet it's also a painting of my uh, son, Matthew. And so it's talking about discovering a morel mushroom and and him out being an ornithologist, he's always been interested in birds and then the classical sculpture to attach myself to the academic world. And that's the creek behind our house. 
I remember this painting's about seven feet tall. It was at the the Missouri State Fair, and there was a couple guys in there when I was in there, and they said, "Man, I'd sure like to find a real mushroom that big." And I'm like, yeah, that's right. Idea. That's the magic morel mushroom. I mean, it's like you know, that's all they Five care about. Call morel mushroom. Yeah, that's their fantasy. Yeah, and this is another painting. Uh, this is also our creek, but of my other son Alex, and he was obviously a soldier in a past life. We didn't introduce him to the idea of of being a soldier, but he was always interested in guns and and being military. So I took the idea of Manet's five player, the idea of teaching kids, you know, patriotism, red, yellow, and blue Legos, and the idea of learning about the Civil War. I hadn't learned a lot about the Civil War, having not lived near it. So the dogwoods, the death of the robin, I, I occasionally include dead birds in my paintings because I did do taxidermy in high school. So it's just a collection That's of- right. collection You still do taxidermy, what do you mean? Yeah. Excuse me? You still do taxidermy. Don't, don't you have yeah. stuff in your freezer? Yeah, there's probably some dead birds in the freezer, but yeah. <laughs> I don't usually admit to that in public, but. <laughs> okay, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. And this is just a playful, silly landscape about the a bird that lives here called a dick thistle, and it's a hard name to say. So, you know, little Dick and Jane. So if you say Dick Thistle, you're pretty close to it. Yeah. An excuse, this is an excuse to paint a Dick Thistle and a, and a, uh, a beautiful Russian thistle. That's really what that painting's about. But so I used, I, I, I have used words on the bottoms of my paintings before. In the Discovery series, I painted each month on one of the, of the, the paintings and made the, the words um, the color that represented that month. Right. Well, well, you, you know, you enter academia and then, um, then you go back, you, you actually get tenure, you get a sabbatical, right? And then you return West. Is this is the, re yeah, I, we, returning uh, I was, West. I, re I was fortunate enough to, uh, be granted a sabbatical about eight years. And Annie and I decided that we would take a semester off and we would drive the Oregon Trail back to see my parents in Twin Falls, Idaho. One of the branches of the Oregon Trail runs into Twin Falls, Idaho. The only part of it that we did that was a little bit different was we went in, in November. So it was kind of fun driving the Oregon Trail in the snow and, and the visitor centers were empty. And we went and did yeah. Christmas in, in Idaho and then went, no, this is cold. Let's let's move south. So, wandered back down past Lone Pine and made it down to Death Valley in the winter and and into New Mexico. This is both of these paintings were over in in the New Mexico region. So sabbatical was basically driving, camping, motelling, and painting on location every day or every day that we could, and then returning back and being inspired by those visions and all of that information that we recorded in our um, our sketches. We have books of of plein air works from from those travel works that are just they're just put away. They're just for learning. This is in Nevada, actually. This is Death Valley, right. California. Marble Canyon. There is life in Death Valley. Oh, there's lots of life in Death Valley. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So, you know, I mean, had your paintings changed at that point? I mean, um, had your way of seeing it, had Missouri changed you at all as the way you saw things? That's a good question. I mean, I, I, I try to paint true to where I am and what I'm interested in. And so Missouri doesn't look like Arizona. It doesn't look like Death Valley. It doesn't feel like those places. So over time, I think you do become entrenched in in the vocabulary of a place. When we go when we go plein air painting on on traveling, we always try to stay for at least two or three days in one place and paint because then it gets over what we call the tourist period of being an artist that when you're just starting painting in a new place. You don't have the you're carrying the vocabulary that you already learned from where you were just painting or where you're you're most comfortable. And those places are different. The light is different in Arizona. The light is different in Colorado. So Missouri or, or Florida. You were in Florida. You're painting Florida. Yeah, that's another, yeah, that's a whole nother deal, the whole swamp. And I haven't really wrapped my head around making a lot of art about Florida. I've painted a few paintings about Florida, but I return to Florida at least once a year to fish with one of my buddies from graduate school another fishing partner andy captain andy so 
I make that down there, trip down there at least once a year. Haven't for a while because of COVID, but I'll be getting back there. Well, let's just run into public commissions because we're going to run out of time here. So let's look at those public commissions, which I think is, well, we got public commissions. Public commissions are uh, more recent. So putting your nose out there and um, fortunately in, in a number of different states and cities, they have what's called 1% for the arts. And so if a city or a state that has 1% for the arts uh, builds a building that's funded with public money, they have to spend 1% of the building's cost on art. So they put out a call, a call for qualifications and they specify the areas in the building that they want. So these are, these are two paintings that were uh, chosen for a new uh, medical building at the University of Nebraska in uh, Omaha. And uh, I did what was, I call these my satellite images. They're about um, the landscape, but I learned, you know, I love maps. So I'm on Google Earth a lot. This was another one for another hospital called Indian Creek. And this is a creek right by there. Interestingly enough, that creek right behind the the pink tree is a used car lot. And on the other side is a uh, restaurant, but <laughs> they wanted the creek for its, for its beauty. It's an old mill creek. So again, it's one of those opportunities that artists are taking advantage of. They're fairly competitive. You need to have a good history, a good record, and you have to be lucky enough to put together a proposal that you know, will actually be chosen or be interested by the committee. Right. Well, I think it's like an amazing. I mean, this is Nebraska, everyone. This is like every, you know, all the Iowans that say there's nothing in Nebraska. This is Nebraska. Sorry, sir. Uh, These are the Sandhill Cranes. And we've been going to the Sandhill Crane migration, oh, at least three or four times. It's uh, this huge occurrence that happens every spring in March. And all the Sandhill Cranes that basically live in the central part of the United States, about I think it's 70 or 80 percent of the sandhill cranes that are alive. But they in can't hear, can they? No, and we they can't hear. We didn't have glass on. Everyone we'll also might see the shades um, of light in there. <clears throat> oh, Annie. So Annie, could you turn off your iPad? Huh? Yeah. Um, you know, let, oh, lost me. So anyway, that's, yeah, that's Nebraska. Yeah. The technical difficulties here. Well, yeah, and your latest work, tell us about what's happening with your latest work, Kansas City Airport, right? Yeah, yeah that's my newest commission. Um, the, we're building a brand new airport at Kansas City, and um, they put out three calls, three three calls. It's a, it's a big airport. Obviously, Kansas City is a big area, and they had 1% uh, for the arts has been in Kansas City since 1985, and 1% of their uh, airport means a 65 million dollars of uh, art to be purchased. So the first two calls were for the big art, the sculptural art, and they were international calls. And they were in the parking building and in the uh, uh, main lobby area. And then there, somebody was smart enough on the committee that, that, that managed this 1%. They chose uh, 19 places in the, in the um, concourses, there's 19 four foot by 20 foot spaces that they only opened up to regional artists. So that that really helped. It allowed me to apply as a regional artist and they chose, a, I, I gave them a, a satellite imagery of four paintings, four different seasons, and it'll be of the rural part of Missouri and it'll have a satellite image of the same view, but it'll also, in, and the sight lines or the lines of sight that we we have on the edge of a rectangular view. And then the shadow of an airplane indicating which, which way it would be from that view to back to the airport. So I connected it to the airport, but I also basically took one of my own ideas, the satellite landscapes and, and bent it to fit the category of the airport. And they liked it. Right, and this is, um, the purpose of this is, they talk about a legacy, right? This is, this is who Missouri yeah, people they are. I heard, I, when, yeah, they gave a presentation to the commissioners who, who had to sign off on the whole, all of the 19 chosen artists, and she talked about it being legacy art. Well, I hadn't heard of the term legacy art. The legacy art is basically art that's bought by a museum or by a public works or any place where it's going to be taken care of private 
private ownership is open to sales. I mean, that's what happens in, in, in the big markets is people purchase an art piece and then they sell it later on. So I suppose Kansas City could sell their public works, but they probably won't. So anyway, versus but, all the art I have out in storage, which is plenty. <laughs> There's plenty of there. But the late, well, you know, to me, it's about, you know, uh, I think it's the important part about is that, you know, uh, Missouri's made a statement says this is who we are. And, and, and these are the people that are representative of who we are at this point in time. And I think that's part of, you know, who their image and their story is. They're retelling their story and, you know, I'm really- Yeah, every, art, every artist is, you know, interested in their own art. I mean, we're talking about visual artists here. So they're interested in what's exciting to them yeah. and the committees that choose these and the museums that purchase art they have their ideas and it, it's it's a uh, it's a process that's going to weed out things and it's going to be a process that's going to have a legacy built it's going to be the story that's what our museums are they, they're the story of uh, of us right no I, and they're changing today you know I, I just went to the art museum in st louis you know and I remember that used to be about Lewis and Clark is my recollection and the two white guys that kind of went up the river and got in trouble. And, uh, but you know, now the story is about Native American, about women, it's like this, the whole story is, is enlarging and that's kind of a yeah. new thing. Yeah, we're, 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 I think we're getting a lot more inclusive. We've still got a long ways to go, but yeah, the, the story is getting bigger. Right. It's a good thing. Okay, well, anyway, that's, hey, that was like the interview right now, and I want to open it up to, you know, the group and see how this part works. So now it's the reunion, so let's kind of Whoa, like... Oh, welcome back. Welcome back wherever we are. Let's have a reunion and party and uh, drinks on Whitman. Right, <laughs> sort of, yeah, anyway. So I'm going to attempt to um, unmute everyone and invite you to unmute. Um, or if you can do it yourself and also show your video. Yeah, we want to see everybody. Don't be anonymous, you know, it's like uh, Nikki and Mitch. Hello, we're there. Uh, that was oh. a fast half an hour, Alan. It was a half, yeah, it was half an hour, wasn't it? Yeah, well, actually, we're yeah. yeah. They go by quick. <laughs> Do we have any questions? Question for John. Dang. Okay, Debbie, well, I see you right there. So any questions for John? Actually, um, I don't have a question, but I'm Douglas. gonna move in. Hi, I'm gonna move into the hallway here and turn around. Okay. Yeah. This is a John Louder piece. Uh -huh. Complete, See, that's completely a, different. Yep, that's a, I that's remember. a wild time. <laughs> I, I, did, uh -huh. I, knew it was, uh, I remembered it being abstracted and flowing, but I didn't remember. I wouldn't have been able to recognize it exactly. My memory wasn't as accurate as that. Very interesting. When, when was that painted? There we go. I would guess junior year, whatever year oh. that was. <laughs> yeah, it was um, it was done for some show, and mm -hmm. I think you won won the purchase of that or something. Anyway, yeah, it wasn't quite enough to retire. I had to work for another sixty years, but you know, well, apparently so. But it hangs on my wall now. Yeah, well, I hope it, I'm making it more valuable for your. your well, every day, life. John. Every day. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. I was, I'm about to take a tour about. You know, I'm not sure where my John Louder painting is. We're remodeling, and where it was yesterday is no longer there. So my wife has been moving things around here. So you know. Uh, but you know, I always love to watch you um, paint, John. Uh, you know, and it's especially the watercolors; it was magical. It takes such a commitment, and it's so so fast and fluid. You know, and it's just it was it was magical to watch you paint in watercolors and just see see something appear. 
you know. Thank you. And I will think of that. Mm. It's Wendy. Hey, Wendy. I'm sitting in my camper van um, about a mile from where uh, I think they're doing um, buds training for this, the baby seal baby seals and not the maritime type baby seals oh, so i can hear so i can hear gunfire in the background oh. so uh, so if you uh, <laughs> so i might mute when i'm not talking just so you don't hear that too. right well but, um, if you start ducking we'll know that you're in the line of fire <laughs> <really right>. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, hello. Uh, john john i um i i just it's very, very exciting to see your work. And um, I had gone on your website and um, looked at some of your, I think it was a website or Facebook page or something that I just- Somewhere uh, out there, there was something. Know, I think when we Facebook friended a while back, but um, I, I, love the, um, I love the evolution of Western art from, uh, yeah, the, the cowboys and Indians stuff to, um, to the landscape. Um, and, uh, you know, represent, I, I just love what you've done by taking the landscapes and putting the, putting the objects and, and I think that the, the, um, the, the drone shots, so to speak, you know, that, that match the, the other views are, it's just inspiring. I really love it. And, um, right. and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Well, and congratulations in, in finding, um, uh, an audience in public art too, because I, I just think that um, I wish we had a I wish we had a a WPA type uh, program right now, and it's good it's in, it's encouraging to hear that that they have that um, one percent uh, program um, out there. I don't think they have anything like that in California that I'm aware of, but um, but I, I I like the idea of your of your art being out where people can can see it and experience it. And I think what Alan pointed out about um, about being in the bank and hearing with the people who work there, how they've, how they've uh, bonded with your work. Um, uh, Bronley, who I think are, Bronley's gonna be part of your series, right, Alan? Yeah, yeah at the, um, the last, actually the last interview. Yeah, she- um, November 3rd, I think, something like that. She was commissioned to do a piece at the a big triptych at, at a senior center in my town, and um, and and so I've had a chance to live with a piece, a public art piece that a that a Whitman alum has done, and it really means a lot to the, yeah, to the people. And, you know, so I hope I hope that uh, I hope that the, as an artist that um, you know. I, I don't know how much of your of your um, um, how much importance you give to the you know private works versus teaching versus public works, but um, but for me, I, I think that I, I just really like to see art in the public. So I don't know if you want to speak to that. So yeah, Wendy, I, um, thank you for all those compliments. Um, anybody that I think has artwork in public art also just makes a lot of art all the time too. So I'm, I'm a full-time artist now. I, I mean, yeah, I'm retired from teaching, but now my wife and I are full-time artists. And and I, I made the joke about, oh, I have a storage building full of art. Well, <laughs> we do make a lot of art if you're a committed artist. And that's pretty much how you're going to get into the public venue also. I mean, there are artists that, that work really hard to work only into the public art venue they they apply to all the different states and that's they make a career of it it's usually it's the higher end sculptural kinds of pieces that are worth you know hundreds of thousands of dollars so lower end me you know painter guy there's some there's some places for that and it's it's variable yeah i i i'll always be making art that's that's what i do well john there's a question that came up uh, john do you find your art changing now that you're retired and you have more freedom um i have more time so i might approach it a little bit differently in the sense that, that i might work on a piece a little bit longer i have more free time to to speculate on it and annie and i just set up annie my wife wonderful artist annie 
excuse me, Helmer Slaughter, if you want to see her artwork, um, set up a kind of reconfigured our house and we have a wall in our living room, one whole wall where we put up the artworks that we're working on and um, check them out in the evening. And then, the, you know, the next day comes along. I don't have to go teach. I get to make art. So I'm a full-time artist now. So that changes it a little bit. But as far as content and interests, and it's always been about whatever I'm doing. So right now we're painting about uh, riding on the Katy Trail. It's a rails to trail bicycle path that's, that's just south of us, about eight miles. So we ride on that every day. And that's that's kind of what I'm painting about right now. So, so I guess the answer is yes and no. <laughs> well, this, you have a unique, you know, I mean, I think what you have to understand that where John lives is the studio. I mean, he's in the middle of 10 acres. Um, everybody True. else has these big lawns. You know, if you've been to the Midwest, Missouri, they have, there's a house and there's a huge lawn in the front that kind of like pushes away the wilderness. In, in Las Vegas, we call them golf courses, but in, you know, they're just front lawns in the Midwest. But, but John has let the, uh, the jungle re-encroach into his property in his front lawn with flowers and trees and, and all those things. And it's kind of- I'm tired of mowing. Yeah, tired of mowing, right? Yeah, everybody's into their lawnmower, man. Lawnmower is a big deal in the Midwest. Yeah, not here. Not, not, yeah, not in your yard. No. Well, you can Small talk about that, that collaborative. Yeah, you and Annie, because I just heard, heard an interview, um, uh, a group you guys are in the Midwest about, you know, that relationship, you know, um, you're both artists, um, you have interesting respect, interesting kind of competition, but you guys keep each other moving. And, you know, yeah, you kind absolutely. of challenge each other. You know, yeah, we're, we're very, very lucky to meet each other. We, we, we celebrate that every day. Right. No, it, and it's a, it's a wonderful environment. Um, it's just, I uh, can't say enough. Scott has a question. Yeah. Oh, God, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, Scott. Okay, good. Um, so David and I got involved in this reunion thing months ago. And ever since uh, I started thinking about reunion and meeting people, I have been thinking about sort of two things. One is, how did Whitman create uh, your, or maybe nurture the personality that I have? And I look at people, I was hoping to meet a bunch of people, you know, and I have Alan and Wendy and so forth and David. And I see that, you know, Whitman had a big impact. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's interesting to look at people who I knew at Whitman and then to see the trajectory of their career or their life and see where it went. So my question to you, John, is what did, how did Whitman, you know, it's very interesting. I love your art. Never seen it, but I, I really enjoy it. Uh, so how did Whitman influence you? And I think about the residential aspect of it. You know, it's a place where it's 24, you are a Whitman student 24 hours a day. It's not like you go there like to Safeway and buy some education every day and then come back and, and so right. forth. It's different, right? We didn't even have cell phones. We had to write letters. Yeah. Remember those? Yeah. Yeah, right. Yeah. Stamps, airmen. Yeah. For me, Whitman was an opportunity to meet people that were maybe maybe admissions is really good at Whitman and who they choose to 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 bring in, and then the size of the school is, is the other opportunity. I mean, I, having been in you know bigger schools and different schools, I still I have lifetime friends from some of the other programs. But usually that's because it was, for instance, lifetime friends from the graduate program, because we were a small cohort of, of individuals with a similar uh, goal or destiny. At Whitman, it's a small place. It's small enough. Everybody you know, that wants to gets to know each other. But the people that are there, I don't know whether they're chosen or they learn to be curious and to get out into the world or, or they're taught to be that way from from just that experience. I'm not sure. I know looking at the friends that I met, they all, you know, they were inspiring. I, I think back about the people that I, I kept track with of and and they're all out doing stuff, you know. So that that inspires me to get out and do stuff. So whether that right. was because I, re we, I really ahead. like 
I really love the word you just used, curious. I, I think that's accurate. I think there's uh, something about Whitman, you know, maybe maybe I'm crazy, but there's something about the students there that um, I think they were curious or and probably still are curious. Which is curious a is a great way to put that thing. And, and I think part of it is the, uh, like what John says, the, the, the smallness of the community. You could meet people from that weren't in your major. I mean, because it's residential in nature, you know, you would meet right. the geology major, the art major, or history major, and things like that. Plus, it's liberal arts, so it's very varied and, and diverse, which it was good. Mm -hmm. So, okay, uh, thanks. I was, uh, it seems I was also to like that, just, um, seems also that oh, at the time that everyone else might be retiring, um, you are. Uh, you are getting the opportunity to full-time do your passion. And right. so, so that's kind of an interesting aspect of what you've chosen to do, right? Right. Well, yeah. You know, this group of artists is definitely the group of we're not dead yet crowd. So, <laughs> and, Well, not, not just that, but maybe now for the first time you're getting to full-time, you know, you, you kept saying, now I'm a full-time artist, now I'm a full-time artist. It's almost like everything you did put into place the opportunity to do what you've always wanted to do. And, um, you know, that that's kind of exciting. And I find that that is also a common thing among the people that I've reacquainted with through this uh, reunion process. Hey, hey, John, I have a question for you then. Okay, so, so as an artist, as somebody that visualizes, sees, and we've talked about things like, um, what did you call, um, visual cubism and different perspective, but what do you think is your superpower? What, what is your magical ability that you think that you have that's special? Yeah, you, you threw that question out in front of me about a month ago and I've been kicking around. Maybe it's, maybe I trip over the word super. I don't feel like I have any super. Well, like a special power, a little thing that, you know, I feel like, like for example, for example, here's my example. I, I just was with John and John like can go on this creek and find arrowheads. You know, I mean, you're looking at rocks like pebbles and and I'm looking at these things and man, John finds arrowheads and shapes and pieces. And I'm going, wow, you know, that is that is a super part because I'm looking at the same sandbank. Of course, I'm blind as a bat, but, you know, I can't recognize them, but you could. So that to me was your superpower at that that day. Yeah, I, I, I can I can get. I mean, being a visual artist, I've been training my visual skills for sixty years. I mean, that's what we do as artists. We we're looking, 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 and interpreting and and transferring that into the movement of our hand, which you know, and then onto the canvas and onto the paper. So that that's a that's a way to see. And then just by nature, I mean, I, I hate to bring up the word curious again, but that's that's a reality. I'm a curious person. I, I, I'm i always looking things up. I love the internet because I can look up things constantly. I still buy books. I love books. I buy books in, in support of the internet. So being, and then the other thing is, is a commitment. You can't say no, you got to keep driving, even though you may not be getting the rewards or the acceptance that, I mean, I, uh, before I got my UCMO job, I had applied for 90 different positions. That's how competitive tenure track painting position is. So, so you can't, you know, eight years later, I'm out of grad school. I'm still teaching at the junior college and I'm, my wife and I are looking at each other going, Oh, we're getting older. Can we do this much longer? And, and luckily I, I didn't, didn't have to make that decision to pursue another another way so tenacity i think that's important mm -hmm. and then uh and i was born happy <laughs> <laughs> uh, can i jump in here for just a second with a short detour because we're about to lose wendy uh wendy's been working on another project for our reunion and i wondered if she might take uh, 20 seconds before she uh she leaves us to uh, just bring us up to date Oh, David, I, I, I only wanted to say that if I, I get, I have a call, I'm expecting a call at five. I just didn't want to be rude if it comes in at five. So just, um, yeah, one of the things that was, was going to happen during the cluster reunion was a coffee house. And um, so we've, um, so we've put together two dates for a virtual coffee house 
um, one on October 23rd and one on November 13th. And, uh, and they will be um, emceed by Ruth Morrow on, on October 23rd and by Denny of Bob and Denny fame on November 13th. And um, many of your favorite artists will be, uh, will be performing either recorded or live. And, uh, and in the spirit of not taking up people's evenings or entire days, um, Ruth, the idea of having it be on a Saturday morning so that you could actually grab your coffee and listen to, listen to some uh, fun music and some banter and also um, uh, have a chance to have just regular coffee house chit chat um, and have a little taste of what a reunion would have been um, if we'd actually been able to sit together at a coffee house. So that's coming up and thank you for the opportunity to um, give that little pitch. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. And by the way, thank you. Thank you, Alan, for putting this together. Oh, my, my pleasure. I'm having more fun at this than you could shake a stick at, you know. But hey, John, just so, so you know, well, do you have any kind of, you know, what is your your next project? Do you have a, another big dream, or is there something else that you want to do, or you know, or how can we help you or support you? You know, what, what is your big dream with your art? Uh, <laughs> Clean out your your garage there. I mean, I <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, come come. Come take art. You, you got to have a big house for most. A lot of it's rather. What was I thinking? Painting seven foot paintings. You know what? The yeah. heck? Yeah. <laughs> That's what we learned in graduate school. Um, That's right. Really, just to to stay healthy, exercise, so I can continue doing what I'm doing now, which is painting, camping, remodeling the house, being outside, meeting people. So. Just, you know, it's good. Life is good right now. So I'm going to hopefully continue doing this as long as I can. Right. You know, are there, um, so, you know, the um, the 1% of the arts, can you tell a little bit about, I mean, for our different communities, because I've talked to other community development directors and say, you know, this should be, I mean, what the arts are all about is like, you know, everything you do, you should be telling something of your story to me. You know, that's what the arts do. You know, um, public art does is, it tells people your story and you know that's like the WPA and that's what you're getting involved with with the Kansas City Airport and everything and I don't know if we could make one more little pitch for public art and how that works. Uh, I just yeah I wish it was five percent for the arts across the nation to heck with one percent you know and <clears throat> I mean we do have we do have a national endowment we do have a you know varying uh, support publicly across the the United States so Whenever we have shifts in in attitude towards art, you know the the funding goes down, and when we switch it back around, it, it goes back up. I mean, I can't imagine that we would want to make art all private and uh, limited exposure. So, bringing art that's really of quality and thoughtfulness and important culturally to the most people is 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 a good thing. Okay. And can I wave the flag for the old hometown? Seattle's had 1% for art since 1973. Good. Great for you. I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. What, what, <laughs> what, are, the, what are the significant pieces of art, art there? You know, is there, are there, that's a long time. And so there's a, quite a body of art there. Well, there, I mean, the ones that come to my mind are there's some Sudakawas around and I think there's a Henry Moore or there used to be, I don't live, I haven't lived in Seattle for years and years and years, but. Right. Uh, my father was the professor, art history professor at the UW, and I think he wrote he wrote pamphlets and guides and things like that. I remember it was it was he was all about it for a long time. But right. yeah, there's a lot there, a lot there. Yeah, you know, John, what we have in our town is um, we have a we have a arts commission that has been um, you know that that where we've had to overcome some. Um, uh, oh gosh, I don't, I'm trying to be kind. We've had to overcome some taste issues, I guess is the nicest way to put it. Uh, you know, where- We have one of those. I keep asking to the, how the giraffe got into our park, but no one answers yeah. the answer question. Yeah, where, where, 
you know, um, where we had citizens who, who who selected some really, I mean, we've had, obviously Southern California has some tremendous artists and we have some local treasures and where citizens got together and picked it and had the opportunity to pick some fantastic art. And then, for example, like the mayor would come along and say, you know, uh, I don't see it. You know, I don't know. I don't, yeah. It looks like a, it looks pornographic to me. You know, I don't think I want that in front of the, you know, and, and what have you run into that kind of issue when you're I mean, we're dealing with with uh, people who just don't get it. And how how do you emotionally I think uh, my mother, who, who comes from a family of artists, she after she was one of the citizens who got uh, whose choices were overturned by a, <laughs> a renegade city council member and she just emotionally she just said she walked away she said i i can't i, I can't get over it you know i'm emotionally you know so upset i i just don't want to deal with those those philistines ever again so um <clears throat> I'm, I'm how do you how do you handle that kind of thing me um Again, I, I superpower tenacity. You just gotta, you know, you 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 build the thick skin, and and you know that one opportunity closes down. There's there, hopefully there'll be another one. So you just you keep going at it. One of my uh, best uh, colleague friends, Robert Colescott, famous famous African American artist. You know his commentary on art was well. Basically, you got to make it, and then you got to put it out there. That's what we, we do. So you find places to put it out there. You know, if they say, no, not here, well, find some other place. That's, that's what we do. I think uh, Debbie's got uh, her hand raised. Yeah, I just uh, when people come to town next, there's a lot of public art in Walla Walla sponsored by Art Walla mm -hmm. uh, and really some creative sculpture. And there's a, the old Odd Fellows uh, in a downtown park and all the windows have been filled with the either old photographs that have been put there or 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 newer photographs and it's been an interesting um addition to walla walla but yes the the taste issue has been raised uh, a time or two so but yeah it, it's great to see that um that change in walla walla as well yeah. Yeah, well, I, another another change that's happening in Walla Walla is that uh, we now have an arts commission. I'm one of the arts commissioners, and we have now just put a proposal out to consider a 1% for Walla Walla's public uh, art. So All right, well, let me know, Doug, and I'll work with you. A commission is a great way to handle that in, a, in the sense that you have to have qualified professionals, um, you know, and who can reach out to the public and get a kind of consensus on art. But all of this art isn't always popular. Like I, mean, I just saw, uh, the, you know, it's called just called the Picasso in Chicago. And certainly that's still a, you know, is it the baboon? Is it the Afghan? But it's a, it's actually one of the great pieces of Cubist art. You just got to walk around it a lot to see it, you know. But, you know, things, it, a lot of art just grows on people and, and becomes part of the community, you know. And um, and it's easy. It's fun to see how that how art kind of like you know becomes part of the community eventually, even when it's controversial. Like the I could, uh, if I could jump in here, Alan. Uh, Carol was just in Walla Walla for a mini reunion with uh, several friends uh, who did come. I think Debbie, you were one of them. Uh, Carol, can you sort of give us an overview of what you might have seen in Walla Walla uh, and uh, how things were with? Uh, the classmates that we missed seeing. Well, I didn't see much of Walla Walla itself. Um, yeah, the short story is the the uh, reunion was canceled with less than thirty days out from the VRBO that Kay Wagland had rented for us. Uh, so she's retired, and also April Brookins, who came, was is retired, and I had already booked my tickets. I live on the East Coast, so what the heck, we went anyway. Um, but I did have like a half an hour to whiz through the campus and it looks beautiful. The Something I didn't appreciate when I was there, the grounds crew has done a fantastic job. <laughs> you know, who thought about that sort of stuff when we were 18 years old, right? 
and a random math professor snuck me into Olin. It's all badged now. It's all, you know, keep out, keep out. So um, you, I was unable to just open a door and walk in, which I expected, which was fine. But a random math guy snuck me into Olin and I was able to go through the gallery, mm. which has an uh, exhibition of Native American things at the moment, which was just fascinating. Um, so that was good. But I was able to connect with Douglas one morning and his wife, Mary. We had lovely tea and... Um, I saw Debbie, yeah, and Kay Waglin and April Brookins, and uh, wish we could have seen more of you, folks. Oh, and I have to tell you that uh, my phone rang while we were um, talking here, and it was the uh, Whitman College. They want money. <laughs> <laughs> that time of year when they always call wanting money, yeah. <laughs> nice timing. Well, it wasn't Nancy, right? She's on this And call. An annual gift is um, greatly appreciated. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I Just will. I will send the thing. check. I will. I promise. That's great. <laughs> Not but yes, it was, but... it was wonderful. And one thing that I found interesting too was so Washington State is apparently under an indoor mask mandate, which Maryland, where I live, is not. And um, you know, recommended mask compliance is uh, hit, hit or miss. But I was very impressed even in in Walla Walla that the the mask compliance in the grocery store seemed to be very high. So I felt very very safe. It was good. Oh, Carol, well, what, are you, what are you doing in the East Coast? I mean, just real, it's because it's a reunion. Just, oh, yeah. Well, how did I, you I, end up in the East Coast? Oh, it's a long story, Alan. But no, I work, I live in Frederick, Maryland. I'm about 45 minutes from um, Janice Glenn, Kenor, Jan Glenn and Greg Glenn. Not even that far, 30 minutes, maybe. What? Yeah, yeah. so uh, I've lived here for about 20 years now. Um, yeah, still working. <laughs> Two years ago. You were you were in Britain for a number of years, weren't you? Yes, I was in Britain for twenty years before I ended up in Maryland for twenty years. So, yeah, I always thought well, it was like salmon. I would return home to spawn, but that didn't happen. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We'll see. I miss the Northwest. I really do. And Doug, it's great to see you, man. I mean, you know, it's been a long time. I, I was just looking uh, at a picture, actually. I should dig it out of, um, you took me on my first um, snow with Art Watson. And oh, yes. so the first day I also, I thought it was a volcanic eruption because the ash was falling from the sky, but you guys corrected me and, and took me up to the snow. So I remember that. Being from yeah, Boy. No, yeah. those were, yeah, no, that was fun. Um, Carol uh, mentioned she had uh, had tea on our deck, and that's one of the things I've been doing for the last few reunions. David has been there. Um, I just have an open house on my deck, and so lacking a reunion to do that. If any of you are ever in Walla Walla, uh, my deck is uh, open for tea, coffee, wine, whatever it happens to be. So um, having been here in Walla Walla for 35 years now, um, it's just a remarkable way to have many reunions all throughout the year. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, with COVID, that no longer happens, but. Uh, well, yeah, I'd like so. to extend an invitation too. I mean, my, like I said, my wife and I are going to kind of a remodel. Most people are downsizing, you know, when their kids move out. I, I call our a popcorn house. We're kind of poofing spaces out. So my wife's dining room table now fits in her dining room with the leaves, you know, we don't have to put them away. So, and we have a, a wonderful porch. And so anybody, um, and, and David visited me and we hadn't known each other. He came visit. Um, so David, yeah, the remodel is almost done. 95% just, you know, but uh, you know, you're, um, anybody's in the Boulder city, Nevada, which is right next to Las Vegas, come and visit. And uh, we'd love to have you here. But, you know, as far as art in Boulder City, it's one of the places, you know, the art of Boulder, um, Hoover Dam is, is one of the great pieces of art, um, I think, in the country that was under my nose. And I realized how important it is because the story it tells is a pretty amazing story down there at the dam. So I would love to give anybody a tour of uh, Hoover Dam and the art of Hoover Dam if you come to, to Vegas. So well, a, a lot of people uh, recall you as a photographer and uh, having looked over your photo page, you're still pretty active involved, uh, actively I, involved with photography. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're still um, involved, but you know, it's kind of like, I'm, I'm like, 
John now. Now I can take pictures of whatever I want. So that's what I've been doing is, uh, is taking, um, yeah, just came back from a, um, actually a, a 10,973 mile road tour of the mid spiraling around the Midwest and ended up spending, I think two or three weeks in Missouri and who would have thought, you know, it was nice. Uh, Scott, are you still with us? Scott? Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, could you uh, could you give us an update on how the uh, project you're working on is going? Uh, oh, uh, I, th I heard the last part, and I think I know what you're talking about. Oh, uh, yeah, I'll give a plug. <clears throat> Since David and I got involved in this reunion craziness, uh, I, one of the things that I've been really interested in is I played rugby at Whitman and I had a wonderful time and I think that the environment of Whitman the residential characteristics and so forth really inspired me to be able to do that any and to, to start that club there um, so what I'm involved in is getting uh, we're having Clive Larson of 1971 grad uh, to come like this in a, a Zoom meeting, give a presentation about his career in uh, rugby. Very accomplished, wonderful, thorough resume as a rugby player and a coach and administrator. Anyway, we're gonna get as many people together, but primarily I've been trying to get um, ex rugby players or current rugby players uh, together for a talk like this. Um, presentation by Cleve and and Kevin Scribner of Whitman fame uh, 1977 75 uh, who helped me put together the rugby club then is going to be moderating it so I'm really excited we've got a date for October 30th at two o'clock in the afternoon it may change but it's pretty settled on that and um, yeah, really looking forward to getting a bunch of old ruggers together. And by all means, anybody uh, here is welcome. And please, if you remember anybody that played rugby or is interested in rugby or was interested in rugby and not interested anymore, uh, <laughs> send, <laughs> send them my way. Uh, you know, rugby is a very, uh, in, in opposition perhaps, to art, you know, which is very constructive. Uh, rugby is something where people like to destruct, um, but it, it was a wonderful, wonderful part of Whitman when I was there. And I look back on it very fondly and getting together with people who played rugby and talking about rugby uh, has been a really very um, uh, enlightening to me to, as, as I said in my question to John, looking at the trajectory of our um, careers or lives and as it started out. And for me at Whitman, it was rugby was a big part of that. So yeah, come did, on. Did and you still play, on. Scott? <laughs> I played up until I was 40 years old. Ah. And I got hurt well beyond. Them. And, and my, my wife at the time, said scott you you shouldn't be playing anymore so i took her advice yeah. like, there's, but, there's no like senior rugby with like modified rules or anything like that well like, i don't know kevin and i were thinking about playing welsh rugby when we came back before it was canceled and welsh rugby is every time the ball goes out uh out of bounds everybody stops and drinks a beer and then gets back on the field and, uh, and plays some more but uh, i'll tell you a quick story david and i we reconnected a few years ago because I was interested in watching the World Cup rugby, South Africa and England. And I was going to a pub up in Portland and I needed someone to go with. So somehow David got a hold of me and we reconnected uh, in a pub in Kells uh, Brewery in Portland. We had a wonderful time. And ever since then, David and I have really uh, rekindled and, and re-nurtured our friendship. And it's been wonderful. Fantastic. Yeah. So that's what I'm doing. Thanks for the opportunity for the plug, David. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be there. Okay, great. Jan, are, are you in Walla Walla too, uh, uh, as, uh, as Debbie is? 
Oh, no, I'm in Southern California, somewhere I swore I'd never lived when I was growing up, but, you know, adulthood's full of compromise. <laughs> Are you an artist as well? No, no. I just wanted to do the reunion. I remember John from, uh, from Whitman. I had forgotten you were an artist, but uh, uh, we, were, we were friends there. Um, so I was, was real interested in seeing what all the artists are doing. But yeah, no, I have no, pretty much no artistic talent at all. I uh, was a research ecologist for the Forest Service for uh, my most recent uh, career, but retired now. Sorry, I had to cut out for a little while. My husband's physical therapist came, so oh. I had to go deal with that. But, so what ecology are you studying? Um, well, no, nothing anymore, um, but it was uh, fire ecology, um, looking at effectiveness of post-fire uh, erosion control treatments and whether they actually reduce erosion and if there were any positive or adverse effects on the um, biological response after fire. Wow. So that's pretty interesting. Well, definitely relevant now. Yeah. The fire is burning all around us here. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I know. I, I kind of retired too soon before the big fires all really took off. I mostly worked in chaparral, not in, with actual forest trees also. So. We have a lot of that in Nevada. Yeah. Kind of scrub. Yeah. Sagebrush and sagebrush. Yeah, we. I'm trying to think of any projects. I didn't have any projects in sagebrush, but I knew a bunch of people that that worked out there, Arizona, uh, or more in Nevada and Utah on on post fire studies. Very cool. No, yeah. Behind me, uh, my that picture is of the the Blue Lakes is up way up in northwestern uh, de near Denial Junction. Oh, it, nice. It, it's a little glaciated place. It's the last place that um, has a naturally breeding La, La Houghton cutthroat trout. There's a couple lakes up there. So it's a special place. And the yeah. fall up there. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. And it's, I haven't been out of uh, Southern California for the last year and whatever, pretty much. I see. I see Liz Neals, who was in our class. Yeah, she yeah. lives. She lives down in San Diego. So we uh, we recently reconnected. Um, both being aggravated with being locked. She called me. She was aggravated with being locked up with COVID. We said, "Are you vaccinated? Yeah. Are you vaccinated? Yeah. Let's get together." <laughs> yeah. so. It also amazes me during people's career, you know, I, I was listening to the um, series of um, Nancy, I, I can't I'm forgetting the gentleman, the, the, the guy that was the March, the Mars uh, rover uh, chief engineer. Rob Manning, class of 1980. Rob Manning, yeah. And, and one of the things that kind of uh, interests me was that he knew every Whitman graduate that he intersected with during his career, you know, I mean, it's like, It'd be funny how they would pop up, you know, like, uh, you know, this guy went to Whitman and this guy, you know, he knew how many people at, you know, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory went to Whitman or social. Did you guys, anybody else have that experience too, that, you know, the Whitman graduates kind of pop up in front of you somehow? Yeah. I, I ran into some either professional conferences or um, I, I went up on the Inyo National Forest to go to a meeting and they put me up in the barracks and it turned out that the young woman who was hosting me in the barracks was a Whitman graduate, a recent Whitman graduate. And we had a great time all evening talking about Whitman experiences and the new teachers and what it was like when I was there. And it was, it was quite a coincidence. Right. Doug, you must've seen several generations of uh, Whitman grads uh, in your uh, last job. Uh um, for those of you who don't know, I was the bookstore director at Whitman College for 25 and a half years before retiring. And um, I would see all my classmates and everybody come back or just passing through town sometimes even. But it got a little scary when I saw the children of classmates graduate from Whitman. <laughs> And uh, several of those, and um, 
So yes, I, I've seen quite a few generations of, of people come through. Um, Have you got to the grandchildren yet? Uh, well, you know, I retired 10 years ago, so there may have been some grandchildren, but uh, I didn't see them. So, uh, but yeah, it's surprising how, so for those of you who know Dan Hoke, yeah, yeah. Um, his daughter is at Whitman now. Oh, wow. He had a late marriage and a late child. And uh, so she's, uh, she's a junior and um, bumped into her downtown over coffee. So, um, so even connecting cool. with the children of, of classmates has been interesting to, to do. Uh, Doug, uh, talk about bumping into people. I think there's a story that uh, you and I have there somewhere about uh, the uh, uh, connection we made in Seattle that ended up uh, with you at the bookstore. Uh, yeah, that was, I was walking down the street in the university district and David said, hey, Douglas. So um, he said they had this opening at Whitman College for the bookstore director position. And um, through a series of events, uh, took a little while, but uh, I was hired and all because of, well, actually David then called me one morning from Bainbridge Island on his postal route, having read the Pioneer that uh, it had reopened. So uh, he called me and I was in North Carolina. So he called me and said, oh, it's open again, so. Well, the other half of that is I had, I had visited campus. Uh, Anna Elephant's no longer here, but I had sort of snuck into her reunion. And I talked to Vern and uh, the person who you had hired instead of Doug was a Rajneeshi from uh, the, the commune in Eastern Oregon. And he had started to stock the bookstore with uh, sunrise color clothes. You know, nothing to do with the, with the Whitman, uh, what was it, gold and blue that we have, right. all sunrise clothes. And uh, I talked to Vern and he clearly was being diplomatic, but uh, it was clear he realized he'd made a bad choice. And I said, you should have hired Doug Carlson. And he literally hit his head. He said, of course, why didn't I think of that? So Doug, you had an inside track on this job, uh, whether you realize it or not. So Doug, you well, replaced Vern, really? No, Vern Solbach actually was uh, was the head of the whole uh, student union. Okay. And so he hired, and we worked under him. But um, that Rajneeshi, um, I got a phone call one day from Vern saying, we've just fired the bookstore director. Do you want the job? <laughs> so I said, yes. So the rest is history. The rest is history. The rest is history. Got me back to Walla Walla and here I am. Uh, I think we're, Alan, we're, we're going on to, uh, we're about a 20 past. Uh, we're very close to a time that we'll have to uh, uh, wrap this up. Did you, uh, do we have that video that uh, you and John made in uh, uh, Missouri? Would you want to show it uh, as we close up? You want me to show us? We'll have to find it. No, no, <laughs> it's not cute. Unless Nancy has it queued up, ready to go. I don't, I right. don't, yeah. sorry. See, you asked the impossible question. I already asked you. Know. Yeah. <laughs> you did, you did get uh, John, John's picture up there though. His, uh, his lookbook picture, you know, which was which was good. Matter of fact, we should all have our lookbook pictures on here. So, you know, get a range next time. Yeah. Well, I wanna thank John um, for his um, amazing, sharing his amazing talent. Um, it was great to meet you and to learn all about your art and Alan for your, for your skill in um, interviewing and um, David for, um, all the work on this um, ser artist series. So it's right. been great. It's been great. And this has been recorded. So if you want to see it again, um, in about 10 days, it'll be loaded on our Whitman uh, alumni virtual page. And um, I know that a lot of your classmates will go there and, and see it. Um, those who hadn't, uh, the timing was not quite right. So. Right. And next week we have, um, Rick Stevenson. Next Wednesday, four o'clock.
that should be fun, you know. So we have, and we have pictures of Robert Redford in, in this thing. This is a really exciting one too. So stay Spread tuned. Spread the word. Yeah. Spread the word. Get your friends to come. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, uh, for joining in today. Uh, we've we've lost a few people. I my I send the thanks out to them as well, and especially to Nancy, Allen, and John, who uh, really have done the heavy lifting on making this happen. Uh, I, I made a few suggestions and uh, they really run with it. And I really enjoyed the, the conversation and I'm looking forward to uh, the other events we'll be putting together. Uh, Alan, last word to you. Yeah, well, you know, thanks for coming everyone. Uh, share it with your friends or however how we do this thing, but ask people to come, come next week. We should have a, a great conversation. I hope you're gonna join us too ne next week, John, you know, and just kind of keep this conversation going. and. Uh, you know, let's discover some things about each other. And it's a great time to reconnect. We're, you know, getting to an age where we're retiring, have other things to do. And let's see if we can, you know, uh, you know, we're not dead yet. So let's keep doing stuff. And maybe it's together. So anyway, thank you. Thank, thank you, everyone. It was fun. <laughs>